didn't even, in fact, when I started writing, I didn't even intentionally start writing horror. It just ended up that I wrote horror because that's where the editors told me I was writing. But I think the first real scary book that really told me that there's psychologically messed up people in the universe was um, Lord of the Flies. And, mm. and when I read William Golding's book, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think I read it cover to cover and then I read it cover to cover again because I could not believe that, that there was this group of people like that. It's just amazing. Yeah, that book was uh, phenomenal. Uh, and I feel pretty much the same way that uh, genre, it was always a bad word. Uh, uh, genre is like a label, a label and labels for the most part don't necessarily unite. <laughs> they tend to put little velvet ropes up. Uh, and I didn't realize how much horror I was into until I started talking with people about it. But my first thing was dark fantasy uh, that had more of a science fiction bend to it. Uh, and yeah, but uh, see, I, see, see, you're calling it dark fantasy with a science fiction bent now, but back right. in the day, back in the day, you, you, it was just a good book mm -hmm. because, because dark fantasy, horror, science fiction, fantasy, uh, romance, those are all, those are nothing but tools for booksellers to be able to know where to put the books in the shelves. Right. That's all they are. And, and I was a, a, a longtime uh, follower of Harlan Ellison. He was one of the, the writers who originally got me all, all kinds of hot and bothered. And one of the things that he was always about was don't try, if you called it sci-fi, he would walk off the stage. And so he was very, very much trying to rub it in people's nose of stop <laughs> using these, these terms. How about later you, Dan? On, later on, I have a good Harlan Ellison story. If uh, oh. if we have time, but I don't want to step on anybody else. Oh, that sounds awesome. I'll, I'll, I'll go for that later. Danger. How about yourself? Yeah. You know, I kind of, uh, am a child of the eighties. So I came of age in a lot of that, uh, that VHS era of movies. Yeah. And, uh, so a lot of that, like kind of cheap, straight to video stuff that would play on cable constantly that I would be sneaking out and having my parent, uh, my parents wouldn't know I'd be watching. Um, is a lot of my kind of the touchstones I had. So I've always kind of been drawn to the kind of the sillier and more surreal aspects of, of horror too, like the full moon movies mm -hmm. and trauma and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably watching those things way too young, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they spoke to me as a as a preteen, I guess, because uh, there's like, especially like Full Moon, where there's a bunch of puppets and little hand gremlins and that that kind of thing too. Um, yeah, and, and, and with books, I was you know obviously I was reading uh, Goosebumps, the R.L. Stein books and stuff. Sure. That was kind of my that was all really popular when I was a a young man. So Mary Kay, how about you? Um, so first kiss with horror in a book, definitely two Bible stories. Um, mm -hmm. first of all, the one that my, my Jido, my grandfather told me, um, when I was being bad was when the kids made fun of the prophet Elijah and then all the bears ate them. <laughs> so that was really scary for me as a kid. And then also sure. when Jesus cast the demons into the pigs. Did not yep. like the Legion story. Legion, still yep. very scary for me. Um, for for a film, I think the first. I mean, it's not even really a, like a horror movie. I know that that's just a way of like categorizing, but it scared me when I was eleven. Um, the Mummy, the the nineteen ninety nine one. I was sure. like, <laughs> Oh yeah, that's my shit. Like I know all of the words to it even today like if someone is like you want to watch the mummy i'm like yes absolutely right now you want to do it right now yeah <laughs> it's my favorite it's, i love it that so was much. a fun one that i was just rewatched it like uh two months ago it kind of holds up like there's parts that are still funny i didn't get them then but now when they're like mm, glenn livett he had good taste i'm like oh i get it now like i understand <laughs> what the joke is and when he swears every damn day that one too. I remember those two, like as an adult, hearing them again and be like, you know, it holds up. Yeah. Have you guys been to Universal and gone on the mummy roller coaster? I have gotten in the line for it and then it broke down. 
Uh, so, well, oh. if you of. get a chance, so we, we were there way before COVID. Um, and you know, there was no line. So we wrote it a bunch of times until I was like, I, ha I have to stop now because <laughs> something's going to happen. Um, but if you love the movie, I think you'll really, okay. they've done a really great job. Uh, See, with that ride it was a lot of fun <laughs> I, i'm that way with the haunted mansion uh i you know i'm not yeah. someone who you would consider a disney person my dad's a super disney person like if he could somehow like live there he would but uh, i've never been that guy but the haunted mansion is my you know yes i'll do anything to ride that you know, because it was just such a thing when i was a kid i love that you brought up the bible because that kind of hits on something that uh you know when you're a kid the things that scare you may not be things that people want to have scare you necessarily. <laughs> so Disney was probably one of the scariest directors around in animation. If you look at the, uh, the idea of Pleasure Island in Pinocchio, where the kids are turning mm. into donkeys, that's yeah. really done in a very horror movie way. Uh, of course, Bambi has two really disturbing scenes in it. Night on Bald Mountain from Fantasia is probably one of the great visuals of what the devil looks like that I think that happens in the 40s. So that's just the part of the lexicon of how we look at the devil. Uh, and it's really interesting that you have those things. But the Bible is really cool because I was uh, I was a evangel I was a kid that was in a cult basically and it was a Christian cult uh, and I was brought up with the world's going to end in 1975 and all of that uh, and so the Bible was full of really really scary stories and they wanted to scare me they wanted to scare me straight all the time because sin was in and uh, so I was really interested uh, to bone chase. So we're going to be starting to talk about uh, Weston's book. Uh, his new book is about giants and the, uh, and the Bible. And so that makes me think of the Nephilim, these giant people, uh, basically who Goliath was, and that they had these weird fingers and stuff. And this is what I was told in my religion about how there were giants. And yep. there so were giants on the earth in those days and, and, and old men of renown. Yeah. Genesis 6-1, exactly. I know Mary Kay is from is from uh, Georgia and I'm from Chattanooga so um, I know that I know that we we kind of were raised in the belt buckle of the Bible belt so um, I, I grew up with just I mean on Sundays on TV there were eight TV stations that all showed all showed um, uh, services mm -hmm. um, and and God forbid there's a football game because it wouldn't be shown it was all it was all <laughs> it was all religion you know um, and, and I kind of grew up in that. Um, uh, but what, what always interested me is, 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 is the idea that the Bible had been written by men mm -hmm. and, and how men have a, um, men or women, there's, there's a fallacy to that. And I also like the fact that in just, um, I think it was 300 BC or um, that there were 70 Greek scholars that came together that, that took the Old Testament because there were so many different versions of the Old Testament mm -hmm. in Hebrew that they had to bring them together and they had to choose what words to subtract and what words to add, right? And they chose to take out the word giant and turn it into angel. And they, and they chose to take out the word messenger and turn it into angel. Because if you take the, out the word angel in the Bible, the only thing that's, that's, that's supernatural in the whole Bible then is what? A burning bush and a sea that moves. Otherwise, there's nothing because, because whenever angels show up, bad things happen. Mm -hmm. Never good things. Right. So, so my idea was, well, why did they take out the idea of giants? Was that intentional? Is that because they're real and they're trying to hide them? So, um, and, th and then I created two competing organizations, the Council of David, who you can who you can you can assume is against giants right <laughs> right, right? <laughs> um and 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 then and then another one who was who was um absolutely for giants so um and it's i've written a lot of military fiction and when you tend to write a lot of military fiction you tend to write from the point of view of a character who's very competent in what he's doing and he knows what he's doing and and, um, you know, you kind of follow the path. In this one, I intentionally chose an out-of-work math teacher from Shadron, Nebraska, who doesn't know anything mm -hmm. about anything. And the person he has to turn to is an ex-girlfriend who is an Army Reserve officer who actually helps him. 
right? Um, um, go through the challenges of being chased by these two organizations while he's trying to solve this mystery. Yeah, there's, uh, I can just see, see, this is the kind of book that would dry, uh, make me go crazy because I love going down rabbit holes. And one of the things being part of a cult or religious fundamentalist cult is it's all pseudo intellectual. You know, you're studying the Bible, you're into numerology, you're, you know, all these things matter. Uh, yep. The idea that this book of the Bible, even though Revelations at the end was not the last book that was written, you know, and it was actually John's on the island of Patmos. And if you look at the timeline, it's at this point and, and all of this stuff is in there. And the idea that there were 33 writers for 66 books <laughs> that are in the well, original. You might, you might not, not like to read this because it might give you PTSD. It might, it might bring you right back to those times. I'm, I'm in is, PTSD. This is the same type of pseudo-intellectualism where I, where I really try and be true to the fact. But, you know, I, I do do a little bit of, you know, shiny object here and there. Right. Um, um, I, I think... Uh, what I did do is one of, one of my subplots is that my main character, I said, was a math teacher. And there are these things called the millennium problems, the, uh, um, where there's, there's like 10, <laughs> right. 10 well, it was eight problems now um, that, that, that were set up in 2000 that were unsolvable math problems, right? And um, I have my main character trying to solve a problem as he's going through this. And my nephew at the time I wrote this was going to Caltech. And Caltech is a preeminent um, math institution in America. Um, the joke is, what do you call an MIT student? Someone who, who couldn't get into Caltech, right? Um, <laughs> no offense to MIT students, but but there's a reason that the space program is at Caltech. Mm -hmm. um, and and, uh, and 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 he helped me kind of frame it because I'm I love having subplots and subplots and subplots and A and B narratives and all these different arcs that come together at the end because it's not just it's it's not fun just to have one simple narrative arc in a book you know you have to have multiple arcs to go through and and the idea that this 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 fella as he's being chased um, across America and Europe and and the Adriatic and every and everywhere else um, is able to end up solving this one problem that has to do with uh, geospatial manifold um, uh, manifold math um, <laughs> is 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 pretty is pretty interesting and and it took pretty much all of my brain power to do it because Scott between me and you so I have an MFA in creative writing and I have 260 upper level credits right but only three of those are in math, so I really <laughs> right. <suck it. laughs> that's I'm so totally awesome. liberal. I'm totally a liberal arts guy. That's that's awesome. So uh, danger, uh, I, uh, because we're talking about multiple narratives in one story and stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, bizarro horror. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this term that not too many people are, are, might know about. The way that I found out about your work was through another writer, James Sabata. Uh, and yeah. uh, he said, uh, you know, there's, a, you might like this guy he has a book called he digs a hole, but this guy removes his, his arms and puts in garden implements so he can dig into the ground. So he doesn't have to argue with his wife anymore. <laughs> I'm like, that's a book. <laughs> okay, let's find out a little bit about this. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. talk about what makes Bizarro horror because uh, what I reading impossible James, mm -hmm. I definitely had a feeling like at certain points, there was more than one narrator. It was like the story goes back and forth. It's kind of like Vonnegut's Galapagos in a way that you have somebody talking about. One of about. my absolute favorite books. Oh, <laughs> so, so that's kind of cool if, if that's what you were picking up on. I'm sure uh, I was indirectly influenced by that, <laughs> if not directly. Um, but the term uh, bizarro horror or just bizarro fiction uh, with a lot of people who write it do because it's not it doesn't always lean into horror I tend to lean into horror with what I'm doing um, and a lot of the other writers of this do but uh, kind of I think a way people can wrap their heads around it is how a horror book is normally scary like that is a it doesn't matter what happens or where the plot takes place, what time frame, the book is probably going to be scary. That is 
like baked into what horror is. So with uh, with Bizarro, it would be weirdness. Weirdness is baked into what the story is or surrealism, you know, or, or absurdism or something along those lines. Um, well, I think so yeah. yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Kind of like Harold Pinter. I mean, if you talk to people about Pinter, you talk to people about uh, waiting for Godot, uh, I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on the name of the, the, the writer for God's sake for waiting at Godot, but th those are absurdist pieces that are considered horrific. That there is yeah. a in uh, there's a central horror to it, especially uh, the birthday party Pinter's uh, thing. I, I've watched that live on stage, and it gets terrifying. And it's just yeah. the way that people are acting, and the fact that you can't grab on to what is necessarily happening. So I think that there there's why I love horror. I, I mentioned it before. Frank's hot sauce. You can find it doesn't have to be so obvious. Horror has the ability to allow itself to be in like any kind of story. So uh, I, I, reading what, ha I don't want to go into too much about your, your book uh, because first off, I don't know how you encapsulate <laughs> everything yeah. that's happening in that book, uh, but cloning is involved. Uh, uh, really, uh, I guess it's one of the most absurdist versions of how hard it is to parent, I think would be, uh, or how easy it is to screw up as a parent. Uh, think that you're doing good parenting and you end up basically causing the end of the world. <laughs> so uh, little things like that. But uh, uh, I, I thought that there was definitely a horrific and a, and a sad story in there and uh, some, some uh, tinges of regret. And yet it's laugh out loud funny. I mean, the very beginning of the book, you're stopping from getting to the story while the doctor who's going to give the, the diagnosis, a fatal diagnosis that's 40 or 50 years out, uh, is uh, he can't help but tell you how much he loves drama. And he starts talking about doing plays. He wants to be a writer and stuff for like two pages before <laughs> uh, you even get to, to what the diagnosis is. And I'm like, okay, this, this guy's going down a road. Yeah, so that I mean, that's basically the first few pages of the book. So I, I kind of do something like that to give the reader a little bit of like, this isn't going to be what you expect it to be. So if you like, if you're not on board within the first couple pages, you're going to hate everything that's about to follow. Like, I'm not writing a book that I know is going to have some sort of mass appeal. I feel like there is a very specific type of person who will latch on to this kind of narrative and find a lot in it there. Like um, it is, it's very, the books that I have been writing are very surreal and they're very absurd. And like you were saying, the absurdism is the horror. The fact that the universe is a place of chaos and that people trying to make sense out of it are usually punished in some way, or if they learn something, it is not, uh, it's the very painful lesson <laughs> that they have to come uh, or, or trial that they have to go through to get there. Um, I really appreciated uh, the, the book. I, uh, it reminded me, like I said, of Vonnegut. In fact, you even had like uh, the gray, the gray tide. Is that? Uh, um, yeah, that's what it's called. Yeah. There's, so there's this, this disease-ish kind of thing. Reminded me of Ice Nine from uh, from Vonnegut's work, where you have this thing that kind of starts as an industrial mistake, and then before you know it, it takes off the, uh, and destroys the entire planet. But also a little bit of David Wong was something that I felt as well in there. So uh, you have that uproarious kind of surreality going on and absurdism with the characters that I really thought was very, very cool. Well, like I was saying earlier too, like uh, with my first kiss with horror being stuff like trauma and, and, and full moon pictures, those are, they lean into the humor of it all and the gore aspects too. So these are the things I've always responded to. So I'm like, I want to make a book that is gory and <laughs> silly and but also might have something to say at the end of the day. Those not not every movie that is that is like that. I'm not gonna say every tro uh, full moon movie has a really something to say about the universe or, or whatever. But but uh, you know, like I'm kind of mixing that aesthetic with the, yeah, the the vonnegut kind of contemplative nature of what it means to be a human in in all this world of chaos. There's a lot of 
philosophical musing that goes on in that in in uh, impossible James for something that is as absurd as it is, and uh, you know, life itself can be uh, pretty absurd too, like true life. And that brings me to Mary Kay, because <laughs> Mary Kay has written a, a book on uh, the first female serial killer, Jane Toppin, and her story. Uh, I mean, even in the preface, you get an idea of how there's an absurdity baked into this story because she's a woman working at a certain point uh, in, in the history of the country uh, in a field that is somewhat thankless, surrounded by huge egos. So she can go and do whatever the fuck she wants. <laughs> it's like she's built in by being so anonymous that she can go and be a killer. So you want to talk a little bit about that, Mary Kay? Sure. I think that you're spot on. I mean, she was a genius and working class and very um, just fun to be around. And uh, she didn't like, I think that she couldn't really, uh, she was kind of mired into the, the class she was in. So she became a nurse and then it just like you said, like uh, because she was consistently underestimated and um, had to take all her rage of the world out on something like um, I, I guess that's what happened. I mean, it, that's the thing about writing like true horror, I think is you kind of just have to decide on some stuff. Like you research everything you can and then you decide on the most likely options, which were for me in this book, uh, her escalating behaviors from being taught to hate herself <laughs> for her whole life and then getting angry about it. Did you hear about her uh, anecdotally? How did this come about that you found her and then were so compelled? Yeah, so um, I listened to a lot of podcasts, especially when I was commuting. I mean, I'm working from home now, so less podcasts, but not a lot less. Um, so when I was commuting, I would, you know, listen to my murder shows and <laughs> what- uh, My what, murder shows. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. what grasped me the most about her story in the beginning was that, um, uh, she was born Honora Kelly, which is the most Irish name in the world. Like that's very beautiful Irish name. And um, her father, uh, after her mother died of tuberculosis when she was in infancy, um, lost his mind and tried to sew his eyelids shut and oh. then realized what he was doing and surrendered his daughters to uh, the Boston female asylum. And I was like, okay, there's more to that story than you're telling us. Because first of all, he tried to sew his own eyelids shut. Okay. Number one, no one can do that because you can't see to do <laughs> the second one. Right. And I was like, okay, well, someone else has to have had that thought before. And, you know, I researched it. Um, because I wanted to know more about the story and I found Harold Schechter's book about her, which um, is, I mean, if y'all are into true crime, you've seen him before. Like he is the man, he's the talking head in all of the documentaries. He's wonderful. Um, but it still like, wasn't really what I wanted to read. Like it, it was beautiful, well-researched, everything I could have hoped for in a book that's, you know, was, the goal was to do that. And I was like, okay, but but also like there's no causality here and that's unsatisfying to me mm. for a human as a human, um, which is the nature with true stories, right? Like A doesn't cause B cause C, like it's much more, uh, it's less linear than that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was why I decided that I needed to do it because no one had done it yet. And um, I did there was more horrors to be, you know, <laughs> brought to the surface especially with like that's one that's got to be one of your first memories right like being dropped off at an orphanage after your dad had tried to sew his own eyelid shut like, <laughs> how do you come back from that mary Kay, can i ask you um did 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 you actually try and go through the process of seeing how you could sew up so you're on eyelid shut because it seems no like um i can barely confident. do mascara on one eye at a time like you can't really look right at it you know you got to kind of Fake Maybe this guy's like an excellent guy at mascara. Maybe he could like Maybe. totally do it. I'm the one who can't <laughs> hold my eye open for the glaucoma test though. So I'm not really the test subject. Like I can't, they have to like fight me because I, it just surprised me. With it. Give me um, a so clockwork orange treatment. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. yeah. 
Wh- so, I'm squeamish about eyeballs. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's one of the great places to go. I mean, uh, dance yeah, macabre. They uh, taste terrible. so uh you want to talk mary Kay, a little bit about your book where the name of it and where you can get it because we have someone in the audience that's basically saying what i love true crime (laughs) what is this book yeah it's called america's first female serial killer jane toppin and the making of a monster um the the first female in america was probably not her but she's the one that we have documented as being an American and a female and a serial killer. So there are some others who like may have been here first and killed more people first. But as far as like legality goes, she's the first one. Um, and you can find it on, I mean, anywhere you can, you know, message me after this and we'll look it up. Um, whatever y'all want to do is, is good with, with me. Um, but yeah, it came out in May. So it's um, it was definitely you know, in the middle of everything else that you could have possibly been caring about happening at the same time. So if it's new for you, that's, I understand. That was new for me too. But yeah, it was like the worst time for it to come out. <laughs> it happened anyway. So, Well, I just put into uh, the Facebook page uh, links to all of your books. So we have a, a link for- Thank uh, you. Bone awesome. Chase, as well as Impossible James and America's First Female Serial Killer. So we, we've yeah. got you guys covered. And, and yours. Uh, Did you put yours in there? Uh, that'll happen soon. Okay. <laughs> Scott, post a link to the Facebook Live page uh, in the chat, will you? Sure. We can do that. Yeah, I'm sure we can. Let's see. I'll do it real quick if you. Okay. If you could, that'd be great. Fiddling. I, 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 I'm fast I, I with the fingers. Black. You're fast with the fingers. <laughs> I, was and I was in the middle of uh, thinking, uh, conjuring up a, a question. Yes, here. if only I could somehow harness so this a, power. So a little break, a little break. Let me tell you my, it's a very quick. Oh, yes. Um, Harlan, Harlan Ellison. Ellison yes. So, so I, I'd seen him many times as, uh, uh, at, at horror conventions. And he's only five foot whatever, but he has an aura bigger than Godzilla. He's like, He's like literary kaiju. He's 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 a, <laughs> he's a he's a very he he carries the wasta with him, and um, and we were at World Horror um, New York, and I want to say it's two thousand five, and um, my wife and I, Yvonne, we entered we entered the elevator. He entered the elevator. And he saw my name, and he and he looked at it, Weston Oaks, right, and and he looked at it and he poked me in the chest. And it's like, he's poking me so hard that it's hurting me. And oh. he's, saying, he's saying, that name, that name, that name. What is that name? And I said, Weston Oaks, Mr. Ellison. And he says, Weston Oaks, Weston Oaks, what do you do? I said, I'm a horror author. And he goes, ha, 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 horror author. That's perfect. You're like the nursing home where people die. You're the trailer park at the end of the road, Weston Oaks. <laughs> oh that's so awesome <laughs> and i'm like and i'm like boy did i win or did he just like totally dog me out i yeah. mean i i don't know but well, I, I'm think just like, like, I think thank you thank you i think you went uh, he like, was definitely like, on the spectrum no, man so <laughs> no vanessa i was totally like i was so like i was so like uh thank thank you mr ellison because <laughs> like you know first of all you got to respect the guy and second of all i just i don't want to be on the on on the receiving end of his oh. barrel because yeah because I've heard legends of how bad it could be. And, you know, <laughs> well, he sent a dead badger to his publisher. <laughs> because so, like- so, so I, I teach online at SNHU, right? And so my intro to my students is I, I tell them that this is how you pronounce my name. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he loved names. I mean, Cord Wainer, I'm forgetting uh, the Cord Wainer Smith. Yeah, Cord Wainer Smith. So that's the thing. You have this insane name and then you have Smith. And uh, he 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 loved playing with names. So yeah, it's great that he found that alliteration uh, that uh, he felt that it was uh, it was a place. But uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a I'm a nursing home where people go to die. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. <laughs> that, it sounds that like you sounds- put a person. Yeah, it sounds like a compliment uh, as it goes in Ellison land. But I mean, yeah, you're you consider yourself the yakuza of the written words. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So, 
you know, we talked about um, all the, uh, the, the MC idea of the absurdity of horror and uh, the real life uh, stuff that was going on and the idea of looking back at the Bible and stuff. And um, it hits me that uh, I think Mary Kay, you had said, man, my book couldn't have come out at a worse time. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it feels like cognitive dissonance is in the air. And That's that true just about every one of the stories uh, that I, I'm looking at from the, the three books uh, from the three authors here seem poignant <laughs> for the time period. And that's something a little bit crazy to say if you think about the things that are in Danger's book. But at the same point, there is this, I think there's uh, for uh, Weston, uh, when we're talking about a bit, a horror that deals with the Bible and people you know, coming up with a pseudo intellectualism, that's kind of the cognitive dissonance that happens in every crack, crackpot religion. There's a moment when life shows the truth and it doesn't match up with what your belief is. And you just right. somehow walk right over that. And you go, no, the, the, we just had the date wrong. For mine, it was the end of 1975 was supposed to be the end of the world. So the bicentennial sucked a whole bunch of different reasons. <laughs> that was a big one for our family because you know people got rid of their insurance uh, they gave away stuff, uh, you know, didn't go to the doctors when they had major issues because they thought they were going to ascend and it didn't happen. That religion's still around and my father is still in it. And uh, me, the, you know, for January 1st, 1976, I was absolutely gone, even though I was just a young boy. I think we're in a spot where we're in cognitive dissonance right now with what we have two versions of the world that are happening. We are. And, and I think uh, the absurd is where we live. And I think uh, the idea of people being ignored and suddenly becoming like these uh, killers uh, is something that's happening. I mean, we have uh, Proud Boys as well as uh, other groups that are out there that uh, feel they've been uh, forgotten in some way and they're going to make sure that we remember. So what, uh, what do you guys feel about what's happening in the world right now? You're writers. We're, we're all allegedly trying to create to continue to keep people from going nuts. What are you guys doing to keep yourselves from going nuts during all of this? Mary Kay? You look um, like... <laughs> We've all um, gone nuts. That's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, we're we're all know. mad. <laughs> I've been nesting real hard. Like there's, I mean, we did the Ikea run this weekend and then got the meatballs at the bistro and then tailgated in the parking lot. And I'm so country that I felt totally comfortable doing that in the middle of Atlanta. So, um, well, listen, yeah, you I do think, that again, you call me cause I'm okay. in. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I think I wore out my boyfriend. I think he was like, no, I'm fine. I'm having a great time. I'll be like meatballs. <laughs> Yeah, Those so good meatballs. they really are. And I think um, I've just been trying to, I think we're all kind of trying to make our own fun because we can't do the things that we would. I mean, like we're all dying to go to a huge indoor holiday party, even though before all of this, we would have avoided it <laughs> like a plague, literally. I mean, <laughs> like we would have hated to do it before this. And now it's just like, I just want to go into a bar and avoid having conversations with strangers. Like I want that. I want that experience. Yeah. Um, so I think we're just trying to like do the, the things that we love, but safely. And it's hard to do in December and when it's cold outside, especially, but like, you know, they had, they have, they're doing outdoor things with like candlelit string quartets. And like, you know, you gotta, we can get around it for a while. I mean, I'm just trying to find as much of that kind of stuff as possible where it's still fun, but uh, safe. I think lowest. it's good you're doing that and being creatives. I'll see if you guys have felt this. I was recently talking to a friend of mine and, you know, it's hard, at least, you know, within film production to try to, to, to plan for things when so many things are uncertain. And so trying to move forward with projects, even if it's, you know, whatever it is that you're doing with with this kind of weird you know is there a deadline i don't know like finding that mm -hmm. motivation to stay kind of on on your path and to continue creating and not just you know completely go crazy and yeah. you know 
fuse into the couch but yeah. it's-, it's tough too when you're a procrastinator and nothing motivates you except the last minute and there is no last minute yeah so you're just kind of like waiting for the shoe to drop yeah i think it's important to have deadlines what's what's kept me going right. is deadlines i've i'm lucky enough to where i'm i'm long in the tooth enough in my career that you know i have i have novel deadlines i have short story that de- short story deadlines I have a Patreon account that I have deadlines for. Um, that really keeps me going, right? Because because I don't want to let anybody down, and mm-hmm. and God forbid I miss a deadline. I mean, that's as a as a former military person. I mean, you can't miss movement. I mean, yeah. that, that's just a terrible thing to do. Missing so that's movement. that's what's really helped me. I mean, I spent seven months not working um, in in 2020 and like you mentioned to you scott i mean i'm really looking forward to 2021 because uh, i'm i'm really hoping that there's going to be just a major catharsis that night i'm really hoping that this new year's eve is going to be like no new year's Mm. eve ever that we've had because it's it's going to be not only not only are are we going to wake up and have pandemic um, um, COVID-19 tests that we can have at home, right? Not only are we going to have um, a lot of COVID-19 um, vaccinations available for us, but, you know, we're going to have a new, a new government, a new president, a new, a new look on life, and a new focus where we don't have to worry every day about what the hell is going to happen next. Because, mm-hmm. because what killed me in 2020 was just the worry, the, 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 the worry every day of what's going to happen to me and my people. And, you know, my people is like you, we have, we have different circles of people, right? We have your immediate family, your other family, your friends, everybody else. Those are all your people, your fans, everybody. Yeah. I mean, the existential dread that we faced in 2020 was absolutely incredible. Um, I'm, Ooh. I'm 50, I'm, I'm 55 years old. I've never felt that in my life. No, no. I mean, uh, and that was one of the things, you know, I, I was uh, watching a thing on heaven's gate, uh, a documentary on the heaven's gate cult. And uh, I'm yep. remembering when you grow up in one, you see all the similarities of certain things that are there. Uh, but I was talking about how how did my parents get in there because you're in the worst fucking day of your life and back then uh in 1972 or 1973 he had gone through assassinations uh you had gone through uh the the uh, chicago seven uh you had gone through black panthers and my dad was uh, an ex-police officer and so this was the end of the world right this was just he was like this is it it's over uh, the the system uh, there was never anything like it he grew up in the 50s so uh, he was sheltered away he didn't work uh, in the uh, san francisco docks in the 40s so he didn't know about that stuff that was going on and you know uh, he missed some of that but he really felt the 60s hard so it was very easy for him to uh find himself going into a cult like that and i think uh some of the stuff that we were feeling was almost like an indoctrination into a uh a a cult like whether we were involved in the cult or not it was like having someone in our family that was in a cult there was this alternate reality of the world that was happening and it was a narrative that was big. It wasn't like Uncle Joe (laughs) believes that Christ is coming. So he's sitting out in the cornfield. This is like policy and, you know, families being broken in two. It was very, very uh, unsettling. And uh, I found it hard. Uh, I found it like being in shock again. Like when my, uh, all this weird stuff happened when I was a kid, there were days in school where I just couldn't stay awake. I'd be sitting (laughs) at the desk kind of falling asleep because it just was so much. And in a weird way, I'm there again. You know, there are days when I'm just really tired. I know we've been uh, talking quite a bit and I know we've only got a little bit of time left. And I know that there are people who would love a free book. So uh, I want to start with Weston. Uh, Weston has been kind enough 
to uh, give an autographed copy of Bone Chase, his new book, his new novel. It's a thriller in the vein of the Da Vinci Code. It's got Bible verse and numerology and all sorts of crazy stuff and fucking giants all over it. So you're gonna want to you're gonna want to read fucking that. Fucking giant, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so uh-huh. Vanessa, you, you want to? Yeah, well, that's how we got Goliath now. But, so they come from somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Which that, just the, the the schematics on that is just a nightmare to think about. But uh, so <laughs> Vanessa, uh, <laughs> let's talk about how we're going to do this. Okay, so when we've done this in the past, we've used the little bingo ball so that it's fair, and we have everybody who's watching comment with a number between one and seventy-five because that's how many balls are in here. Um, and I'll spin it and we just pull until we get a number and then that person wins. And then we will ask the winner to private message Hellbent for Horror with your uh, contact information so you don't have to put it out there to the world because yep. it's 2020 after all. <laughs> and we will oh, we can find it, that means. You know, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like uh, you're going to want to roll because we already have people shouting out numbers. Uh, well, we should and let then, them shout them and out. Then, uh, Scott I will draw. send the uh, address to me and I'll go ahead and send them to. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So, so yes, bring, bring in the numbers. We can talk amongst ourselves. I see yeah. we got Carrie, Joe. Yeah. 27 and nine so far. And um, I'm also going to be giving away a, uh, a copy of my book uh, autographed. And uh, also today starting, uh, yeah, it's on my shoulder, my book. <laughs> it's always on my shoulder, but there we go. Bone chase. And it's a great photo as well. Uh, yeah. Notice the middle finger. Yep. I saw it. Especially if it goes so well, if you're like looking on like books. Because there's com. six fingers on the hand, right? Yeah. Right. And that's the oh. Nephilim. It's the Nephilim. So, oh my goodness. Oh, Yvonne. We have, that is not between one and 75. Yeah. <laughs> no, no Avogadro numbers, by the way. We don't need any of that happening on this. Uh, so, I'll be uh, giving away one of my books. And also, uh, if you're uh, more of an ebook person, uh, I am putting it on sale for 99 cents starting tonight for a week. Uh, and uh, you can go right to Amazon to be able to do that. Of course, if you're looking to just uh, buy the book for someone else as well, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to uh, sign a book and personalize it for the holidays and, and other times. Uh, so um, let's see. We have a couple numbers. Going up. Pardon me. We've got, we got, we got to have my lucky pen. do this or I'm just going to keep I know. trying I'm until like, we get those numbers. Just, yeah. That's all, all we've got is uh, those two so far. So hey, I tell you what, wanna... I mean, it's up to you guys, but if, if, if people Close are not going to want to play, I'm going to say those two numbers are winners. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that as well. Yvonne. Yes. She has access to free copies. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Wink, wink. That's, I think, the benefit to, uh, okay. to that. So for, for those that were paying attention, <laughs> yeah, feel free to reach out and put that to uh, Hellbent for Horror. Uh, well, actually, what we should do is uh, Carrie came in first, I guess would be the thing. And uh, I'm also going to be giving away a copy of my book. I, I don't want to uh, have more than one copy for anybody. So uh, we'll get a copy to... Uh, um, Joe Golden and a copy to Carrie Yates. Uh, Yay! Yes. And, yeah. and thank you so much uh, for uh, putting a book out there, Weston, for this. And oh, sure. No problem. Yeah, I'm going to have to pick up a copy of that because that sounds well of everybody's actually because now that I get to hear more and more about everything, it just I need. Well, it's I in, always have to have a stack of books to read, or I start to panic. It's in hardback. It's in um, Kindle. It's in audiobook, and it's also in. Um, I think they have it in CD as well. Hmm. Well, who? What year is it? Well, no. Well, no. Who's See, using the CDs? <laughs> audio. Uh, when you say audiobook, it's digital, right? Uh-huh. And uh-huh. CD means you can take it away. And like and like put it in the car. Oh right. Throw it at somebody. 
Yes. Like a ninja star. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my book is in Sanskrit I, and Cosmic <laughs> Spool. <laughs> I think I read that, that the audiobook and CD is like nine hours and 32 minutes. So, so that'll take you from here to LA and back. Yeah. Well, where are you? Arizona. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> Uh, any of you want to talk about uh, the time is correct not me <laughs> i was like i was like <laughs> you're not from over here it'll it'll take mary Kay down to orlando you're right yeah. about that. us uh, yeah. georgia gals it'd take a little right. longer yeah yeah but yeah. we could listen to it a couple times mm -hmm. yeah okay so in, since we Danger, where do you live hmm. oh i i'm in portland are you in portland yeah, so I guess I could go to Seattle and back and back to Seattle in nine <laughs> hours. Publisher. I'm sorry, what? Who's your publisher? Um, it was Fungasm Press, uh, which yep. is part of Eraserhead Press, which yep. is out of here. Yep, yep. No, I've, I've known Rose. Um, oh, yeah. I've known Rose since she was from Tucson. Oh, so, <laughs> all right. So I've known, I've known Rose forever. Rose is a great, great person. Yeah. Yeah, she's great to work with. And I got to also work with John Skip. Uh, he was kind of in mm -hmm. charge of Fungasm. He's like his own little boutique. So he's yeah, actually he, the editor he on all my moved books. up there from LA. Yeah, it's, I, I've talked to him online and he's just down like, you know, 20 minutes away. And well, then you know, we're, we're, keeping, we're keeping distant. We're trying no, to. <laughs> no, 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 no. You got it. I mean, you have to do the John Skip experience. Oh, we've, we've hung out a few times. Um, Okay, you know I, it then. Yeah. <laughs> you know the deal. Yeah, he when he used to live in LA, I would stay at his house. Uh, he used to have this beautiful up in, house. Up in, up in Eagle Crest? Yeah, it was so That's nice. Not his house, that was a porn star's house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I see that we're running out of time. An hour just kind of blasts by very, very quickly. So I want to do a quick round uh, for people to talk about uh, whatever they'd like to promote uh, as well as uh, if there's anything that uh, you're reading now that you think might also be something I like to spread the wealth uh, if we know of any other authors and writers uh, that are doing anything that's uh, exceptional uh, I'm, I'm always happy to get my writing list or my reading list up as well mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Who, who wants to start not me because I want to grab something danger <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, if, if you want to check out my stuff, it's at all the usual places uh, that you could find books. Uh, I'm not going to tell you to go to Amazon and find it because, you know, it, they don't need the money. But there's a you could go on to I think it's called bookshop.org. Mm -hmm. And it's yes. kind of a network of indie bookstores that uh, yep. you could buy books through. Uh, it might cost an extra dollar, but you're actually helping small businesses and authors out when you buy from there. So I would suggest, unless you're buying stuff from Amazon anyway, and you wanted to throw my book in there to go to bookshop.org and do mm -hmm. it all from mm -hmm. there instead. And that goes for everybody buying books yes. at any time. Um, and if you want to talk about something that I'm reading, here's, I'm reading a Bentley Little novel right now. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever read Bentley Little, um, but I think he is a good author to kind of bridge the more pulpy like horror tropes that you would find with the kind of weirder bizarro side of it, because his stuff tends to go really strange really quickly and just <laughs> keeps on the gas. And he's one of my, uh, I've only started reading him a few years ago and he's now one of my favorite authors. Nice. That's awesome. And I, I love, uh, I also uh, talk about the, the mom and pop bookstores and things like that. I, I put the ISBN number out there so that if you want to help the per people that are right down the street uh, that are just hanging in there, uh, you can do that as well through there. Uh, and uh, I'll have to take a look at that. I, I will say that I have a couple of books that I'll bring up at the very end, but Mary Kay, how about yourself? Um, where do I start with my book? If you'd like. Okay. Um, so seconded everything Danger and Scott said, um, buying a book is great. If you can buy a book from an independent bookstore is even greater. So, because like you said, you know, it goes to, uh, businesses that in this trying time are treading water. <laughs> so every little bit helps. Um, and, oh, I also 
co-host a podcast about scary movies, but it is a comedy podcast. It's called Everything Trying to Kill You. Um, this Friday, we'll have an episode about the Mothman prophecies, aka your favorite Christmas movie, which makes no damn sense in retrospect. Like, is it a prophecy? What's happening? This, what is, anyway. Um, so there's that. And then two books. I think these are my two favorite books that I've read this year out of 38 and a half. So um, number one is Bunny by Mona Awad. Y'all know that book? No. It is spooky and very like girly also. Like it's like a, a click kind of thing, but it's Y'all gonna like it. It's good. And then um, Sleep Donation by Karen Russell. I, that one didn't come out this year, but is real good. I have that um, one. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't read that yet. It's a novella, which um, is one that you can like maybe read in one sitting if you really try hard, which I basically did novella. because I couldn't put it down. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was real good. So those are, my, those are my two recommendations, Bunny and Sleep Donation. Nice. Both awesome. Spooky. Yeah. Uh, Weston? So I also wrote Pets During Wartime, Ooh. Um, which, is a, uh, which is a novella um, that comes out. It's, it's in hardback and um, limited hardback, limited paperback from Thunderstorm Books. I wrote this in Afghanistan two years ago. Um, and it's the premise is, well, there's, there's a lot of the river in that's a real thing to where when the Colorado River reaches certain levels, different states um, stop receiving water. Mm. And, and what, if, what if Arizona has no more water and pets are outlawed? Because, mm. because pets take up water and people need water. And so the idea is that pets are smuggled, much like Bibles were. Huh. Um, so it's called Pets During Wartime. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that book. Oh, it's that from sounds Thunderstorm great. Books. Um, I need to get that. Uh, um, you know, just go to Thunderstorm Books. Uh, you know, GTS it, Google it. Google that shit, you know. <laughs> Google that shit. <laughs> GTS, man. Um, and, then, and then I think, I think probably the scare, I've, I've, I've read a lot of good books this year. Um, and I've, and I've discovered a lot of new authors, but I want to go back to an author who's a friend of mine. Okay. Uh, I want to make it clear. And, and he's, he's, he's been a solid author, um, his entire career, but for the first time, he's actually scared me. This book is actually scary. I mean, more scary than any Stephen King book I ever wrote, read. It's called Red Hands by, by Christopher Golden. Ah, Authentically scary. Down. I read this book and I'm like, OMG. That's awesome. And, and when this is over, I'd love to get a, a list of the, the books in case uh, well, I don't have them all written down so that I can hunt them down and also put them out for anybody who was listening uh, and oh, watching sure. that would want to take a look. Uh, that a uh, really great list. I have a couple that have just stuck out for me this year. Uh, Cosmology of Monsters. I, yeah, I, I, yeah I really, book. really appreciate that. Yeah, it was like, uh, I, I don't know how to best explain that book, but it's that's kind of like- That's the first book, right? That's the yeah. first book. Yeah, it's a first book. It's yeah. kind of like John Irving goes yep. supernatural. And there, there, yep. so it has that whole thing of humor turning into tragedy. And I really, really yep. appreciated that. And The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham yeah. Jones. Yep. Really liked that book. And, because I thought I knew everything that was going to happen in the very beginning. And I was like, it can't just I kid be. You not, that, that book is going to win a Bram Stoker Award and, and probably a Shirley Jackson. Great. It's very good. I think it deserves that it was because. A, that was a great book. And only he could write it because, because if all of us wrote it, you know, um, it would be okay. But we're not an Indian like, right. like, like Stephen Graham Jones is. And he yeah. brought that authenticity to it that we can't bring to it. Oh, yeah. And you get thoroughly we, immersed. Yeah, you get thoroughly immersed, and I was uh, I was really stunned by it because uh, in the beginning, you know, I was like, okay, I think it's this, and then I'm going, oh, it's gonna be that. The narrator is gonna be, able and it's like, wait, there's a lot of book here. <laughs> what is gonna basketball is a hero. 
Yeah, right. It's like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, and, and so there's so many really interesting things that go on inside of that book. Oh, yeah. I, I'm part way done with uh, Jonathan Mabry's Inc. I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. So I have to see how that's uh, how that's going to roll out. But I'd love to, I need to talk with him. I had to, had to write him and just say, how many ideas are you like? What was the, the, the taste that got you to go down that path? It's a really interesting yes. story because I have Inc. I, 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 I'm someone who's been tattooed as a horror story around tattoos, what they mean to people and what happens if they are temporary, more temporary and the, the, the memories are temporary as well. And, and so it's really, it's an intriguing monster that's in there. And of course you can't help but think of the illustrated man, but then it goes elsewhere. And uh, I really appreciate the, the main character or the anti-hero character that's in it. I shouldn't say main character, but and so I, 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 those are my three for, for this year. I found that I did not finish books that were about the pandemic, weirdly enough, or books that were about plague. I just couldn't get into them. Some big writers did that this year and it just didn't work for me. No, I, I it's found too my... soon. It's not escapism when it's happening. <laughs> the only one I read that was that was um, a pandemic type uh, related was Wanderers by Chuck Wendig. I like that... that one. It was great, but that came out right before everything happened. Yeah. Oh, had beforehand, out, yes. Had it come out two months later? Yeah, and that's uh, uh, Trembley's new one. I couldn't finish because uh, it was yeah. zombies, but it was more pandemic-y in the, in the way it was done. And it was just There's... like- That's tough. And, and you know, the question is, is, is are the, I know we're over, but the question is, is, is so what's the new fiction? Are we gonna write about the pandemic? Are we right. going to write about this or, or do people want to forget about it? Do they want something else? Yeah. Do they want to, do, do, do they want to push the pandemic aside and have, and have more green blue fields of, of, of free non-pandemic, non-Trump lives and stuff like this? I mean, I mean, what do we want to read in the near future? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And uh, I mean, we could go on for a long time, but I know I've uh, asked only for an hour from you folks. Thank you so much. I see more. I hope to have you all on again. Uh, and uh, Danger, I want to talk to you about a million uh, different versions of Kit Kats that can be eaten as well as yeah, yeah, several yeah. other things. I think you're, you're the Guinness, you uh, eat and breathe the Guinness Book of World Records. And uh, that's another thing that I wanted to hear about. So there's a ton of stuff. That, uh, and uh, Weston, I wanted to talk more about some uh, military horror and the military exploits and Mary Kay. There's so much about working at Book Riot and just uh, dealing with writing and writers and what really it's cool. like to, to just go write, you know, have, having to read that consistently. And what do you feel you're seeing as trends. So, I mean, there's a million things we could do a, 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 a sequel here immediately, but I know that uh, uh, folks, especially back East are getting a little bit sleepy. So it's uh, <laughs> been wonderful. Thank you all for being on. And thank I you want for having thank us. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Yes, it's, it's, it's a real honor and nice uh, we'll have to. Guys. Yeah, nice it was to so you. wonderful yeah. to talk to all of you. Yeah. Thank you, fellow That's artists, wonderful. right? Thank you for your art. That's what I like to say all the time. And I do mean that. Thank you Go for ahead, your Drew. art. Go Probably going to save all of our lives. We're all going to save each other in this crazy lifeboat that we're in, this rickety light boat. Oh. Uh, and for those that have been watching, thank you so much. And remember Yay. to stay hell bent. <laughs> <laughs> and